the British soldier. All around the globe you'll find him, from Gibraltar to Hong Kong. Everywhere he stands against the threatening years, staunch symbol of our common will to order. British Empire, the largest empire the world has ever known. For over 300 years, Britain ruled, its armies conquered, and its bankers proclaimed the might of its currency. But one day, it all began to fall apart. One by one, countries declared their independence from Britain, and no amount of force could reverse the tide. As British elites saw their wealth, privileges, and empire disintegrate, they began to search for a new role in a changing world, and they found one in finance. This is a film about how Britain transformed from a colonial power to a modern financial power, and how this transformation has shaped the world we live in. In the days of the British Empire, the City of London was the world's biggest global financial center. The City of London was the kind of beating financial heart of the British Empire. The historians Kane and Hopkins call it the governor of the imperial engine. All these countries in the empire um, used to use the sterling currency and the City of London was kind of the financier of this zone, not just inside the sterling zone, but outside the sterling zone as well. As Britain's empire declined, so too did the city of London. One British army truck is bombed, killing two soldiers and wounding 12. As rioting becomes daily more widespread on Cyprus, young people of high school age take an increasing part in the violence. Here, a group of girls are being dispersed after a rock-throwing battle with British military police. With the decline of empire, British commercial interests across the globe were under threat. In 1956, Egypt nationalized the Suez Canal. A new Middle East crisis arises as President Nasser of Egypt tells a wildly cheering crowd in Alexandria that Egypt has seized the internationally owned Suez Canal. France and Britain issue a 12-hour ultimatum. Within hours of its exploration, Britain's warplanes are winging their way to Egypt and its bombers attack five key cities, including Cairo. The United States was opposed to the invasion and put pressure on Britain and France to withdraw their troops. There will be no United States involvement in these present hostilities. It is our hope and intent that this matter will be brought before the United Nations General Assembly. There, the opinion of the world can be brought to bear in our quest for a just end to this tormenting problem. Britain was humiliated. The Suez Crisis signified the end of Britain's role as one of the world's major powers. Following the crisis, there was a run on the sterling, on the UK pound. Some people suspect that the American government was encouraging this run on the UK pound. As financiers withdrew their money from Britain, the value of the pound decreased. To protect the value of the pound, Britain limited the bank's overseas lending. They were not able to invest abroad. And obviously, they were unhappy. And we don't know exactly the context, but it's very clear that the banks or their representative made a representation to the Bank of England, which in itself was dominated by representative from the banking industry. It seems that they have reached an agreement which was never written that if the banks 
um, intermediated between two non-residents in a foreign currency, in that case the dollar, then this particular intermediation, this particular deal, will not be considered by the Bank of England under its own jurisdiction. The banks began to create a market for dollars in London, called the London Eurodollar market. To differentiate these euro market activities from their domestic banking activities, banks kept two sets of accounts. The Bank of England, the UK regulator, declared that the London Euro market accounts were not in London. They were elsewhere, and therefore it had no responsibility for regulating them. It's about providing a legal space in which you pretend activity is taking place. And the importance of that is that you pretend it's not taking place in the economy where it really is taking place. So you're taking activity from the place where it's regulated and taxed and pretending that it's happening elsewhere. Now where doesn't really matter, it's just elsewhere. When American banks realized that London offered the ability to avoid US regulations, they moved their international operations to the city. Around the same time as American banks were moving their international operations to London, another new kind of financial space began to emerge, far away from London, in Britain's overseas jurisdictions, the last remnants of empire. Back in the 60s, the Cayman Islands was a complete backwater. The stories go that mosquitoes were so thick in the air sometimes they were enough to suffocate cows. That's a legend that you hear about the Cayman Islands. I don't know how true it was, but it was, there was nothing happening there. Accountants and lawyers from London arrived in the Cayman Islands and other British dependencies and began to draft a set of financial secrecy laws and regulations. Because these jurisdictions' main selling point was secrecy, they were called secrecy jurisdictions. What the Cayman Islands was doing was straightforwardly illegal activity. Drugs money was coming in in huge quantities, um, tax evasion, whatever, whatever you wanted, you could have it. The Bank of England was observing the developments from London and noted in a report marked secret, dated 11th of April 1969, we need to be quite sure that the possible proliferation of trust companies, banks, etc., which in most cases would be no more than brass plates manipulating assets outside the islands, does not get out of hand. There is, of course, no objection to their providing bolt holes for non-residents, but we need to be sure that in so doing, opportunities are not created for the transfer of UK capital to the non-sterling area outside UK rules. These small territories, the last remnants of the British Empire, which are still overseas territories today, they are still the last remnants of the British Empire. Um, there are 14 of these overseas territories. Seven of them are bona fide tax havens, including the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands. Um, some of the biggest tax havens in the world today are still British. With access to large amounts of offshore money, the euro market grew rapidly. By 1980, it had reached $500 billion. By 1988, $4.8 trillion. And by 1997, nearly 90% of all international loans were made through this market. The British Empire had sunk, leaving hardly a trace behind. But the city of London adapted and survived. The City of London, London's financial district, is a peculiar place. It has been called a city within a city, a state within a state. It is run by an organization called the City of London Corporation, a private company that performs all the functions of a local council with a private police force and private courts. Those of you who aren't from the UK, some of you even who are, uh, might not be aware just how weird a thing the little city of London is within the big, the big London. The city of London is uh, a, a separate entity to uh, the wider London. And it has its own uh, head, the Lord Mayor, who's distinct from the mayor uh, who runs the rest of London. 
Every November, the city stages the Lord Mayor's Show, the world's oldest civic procession. The City of London has long had this curious legal status because um, back in 1066, when William the Conqueror came over, the city was one of the only portions of England that he failed to conquer, and he struck a deal with the city in 1067 that allowed them to continue functioning. To this day, the City of London is exempt from numerous laws that govern the rest of Britain. Its political system derives from the Middle Ages. The city's electorate is dominated not by its residents, but by the private businesses operating within the city. Its Lord Mayor is selected by the heads of medieval guilds. They have a, a representative in the House of Commons called the Remembrancer. Apart from the clerks of the court, of the House of Commons, he's the only unelected person there. All other lobbyists have to stop, you know, in the lobby. They're not allowed yeah. past the lobby. The City of London has a permanent representative in the House of Commons, whose role is to report back to the City of London Corporation and to lobby Parliament on behalf of the city. The Corporation of London, clearly, it's a uniquely unique and interesting phenomenon that should have attracted uh, many political scientists, political economists and economists. But I don't know of anyone who has studied systematically the Corporation of London and its impact on policy or economic policy. So we can only surmise. Some people uh, assume or surmise that the Corporation of London is extremely powerful and is able in one way or another to shape uh, British policy, particularly with in financial matters. Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister after the Second World War, um, had, had something to say about the City of London Corporation. He did, so, yeah. Yes. So over and over again, we have seen that there is in this country another power than that which has its seat at Westminster. The City of London, a convenient term for a collection of financial interests, is able to assert itself against the government of the country. Those who control money can pursue a policy at home and abroad, contrary to that which has been decided by the people. At the heart of the City of London stands the Bank of England. The Bank of England is not just a central bank, it is also a financial regulator. At the demise of empire, the Bank of England used this regulatory authority to help attract the world's banks to London. In 1972, the Bank of England issued a license to the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which set up its head office in London. Within 10 years, BCCI grew into the seventh largest bank in the world. 10 years later, BCCI was bankrupt. The deputy director of the CIA, Richard Kerr, said late today that the CIA did use BCCI to support CIA activities overseas. But BCCI had not just collaborated with the world's intelligence services, it had also engaged in extensive financial fraud, money laundering, and terrorist financing. BCCI constituted international global crime of a level that boggles the mind. BCCI was financing terrorism. The Bank of England knew it, says the report, but instead of supervising it properly, it tried to prevent the bank's collapse. I am saying very directly that the Bank of England had sufficient information in front of it to close BCCI 15 months earlier than it did. But millions of depositors were hurt in that process. Numerous whistleblowers from BCCI had contacted the Bank of England, yet the Bank of England did nothing. The Bank of England had plenty of time to intervene and investigate, but it did not do so because the tradition at that time, which still survives, is that, well, actually, you know, you have to just kind of send hints and talk over lunch tables with the chaps regulating other chaps, and all would be well. 
Robin Lee Pemberton, the governor of the Bank of England at the time of the collapse of BCCI, commented, the present system of supervision has served the community well. If we closed down a bank every time we found an incidence of fraud, you would have rather fewer banks than we do at the moment. London was a place for banks to engage in business that was not allowed elsewhere, where senior bankers did not have to worry about the consequences of their actions. This is one of the reasons why today there are more banks in London than in any other financial centre. In Britain, nobody goes to jail. No bankers go to jail. They generally don't. They are a protected species. And that is part of the offshore business model of the UK, is to say, we will protect you. We will bring your money here. We will look after you. We're not going to put you in prison. We'll let you do what you want. Light touch regulation was one way of attracting business to London. Another was secrecy. From the 1960s onwards, City of London institutions began to establish offshore branches in former outposts of the British Empire. Their aim was to create offshore centres with strong secrecy legislation in order to attract capital from across the globe. Swiss banking secrecy is the most famous and most well-known. You know, you put your money in a Swiss bank and they won't, they promise not to tell anybody. And that's one kind of secrecy. But another kind of secrecy, which is very British, is the trust. And the trust is a very um, slippery, complicated and devious mechanism. Trusts emerged, the legend has it, from the time of the Crusades when the knights would go off and fight in foreign lands and they would leave their assets in the care of trusted stewards. What trusts do ultimately is they play with the concept of ownership. Ownership is not such a simple thing. So the settler, the knight in this case, would hand over the assets to someone who these days would be called a trustee. It's often a lawyer. Legally, you are separated from those assets. They're not yours anymore. There's a barrier. You can't be taxed on them. You can't be... Nobody's going to find anything about your connection to these assets. In Britain's offshore jurisdictions, no qualifications are necessary to be a trustee. Anyone can set up a trust and act as a trustee. There is no registry of trusts. There are no bodies to certify that a trust has been set up. The only persons who know about the creation of this agreement are the trustee and the settler. There's no obligation to register it. There is no financial reporting obligation of trusts. They're not required to put annual statements onto account anywhere. So actually trusts are, to all intents and purposes, invisible arrangements. Economist John Christensen was an economic advisor to the secrecy jurisdiction of Jersey for 10 years. We're not talking about a few million. We're talking now about trillions. Trillions of dollars of capital, which apparently belong to nobody. For tax purposes and for other purposes, they belong to nobody. Everything, works of arts, gold bullion, horse race horses, cars, real estate, not just financial assets, but a whole load of non-financial assets belong to these trusts, sitting there, belonging to nobody. Now think that one through, because we are talking about maybe as much as $50 trillion of assets sitting offshore behind these instruments. Well, the Cayman Islands are among several British overseas territories who have signed a new information exchange agreement with Britain and the rest of Europe to tackle tax evasion. The countries are now required to automatically provide details of the ownership of bank accounts and how they're used. Cayman became the first signatory last week. It's important that the Cayman Islands should be recognised as the first overseas territory to sign such an agreement with the United Kingdom. And I think this importantly reflects the constructive approach that the Cayman Islands has taken in delivering our shared objective of rooting out tax evasion. The trust lies at the core of the British secrecy model. They don't use banking secrecy. The Swiss use banking secrecy. The British, of course, are only too willing to kill off banking secrecy because they will then capture a larger market share. That's why the Brits are doing this. Trusts are the basic building block of Anglo-Saxon secrecy, and they form the basis from which complex offshore structures are created. 
every secrecy jurisdiction offers a specific set of services, from trusts to shell companies to secret bank accounts and nominee directors. The combination of these services into complex structures spanning multiple jurisdictions enables the creation of secrecy structures that are almost impossible to penetrate. An offshore structure will often have a trust kind of sitting at the top of it. The trust will be here managing the assets, kind of controlling the assets. Underneath it, the trust will own some shell companies. Each one might be in a different jurisdiction. So you might have a trust in one jurisdiction whose trustees are somewhere else, whose beneficiaries are somewhere else, which owns offshore companies somewhere else. Each of these companies might then own assets, so that they might own you know, a bank account, a racehorse, a yacht, a painting, um, a portfolio of shares or whatever. There are numerous variations of trusts and offshore secrecy structures. There are offshore lawyers whose work entails the creation of ever more complex and obscure structures. The aim of these structures is to hide the identity of the owners of offshore assets and allow offshore wealth to be recycled back into global markets. But looking on the amount of money uh, being administrated from tax havens, uh, you see that it is a curb going like this. And all the talking we have been doing along with other wonderful people fighting against tax havens has not changed anything, you know. It is the world where you say, go on talking, and go on talking, you're interesting me, and I'm going on doing what I want to do. We know everything today because we have had the Panama Papers, we have seen it, and we are not able to act upon it. And we are not able to act upon it because this system is really protecting the few people that are having benefit from it. And these are in percentage very few people, but they are powerful. And I see in the Panama committee that I'm sitting in, the only thing that could change this is to have a public accessible register of the beneficial ownership of trusts and of all kinds of companies. It is easy. The Panama Papers are a collection of leaks from the offshore law firm Mossack Fonseca. Mossack Fonseca is the fourth largest offshore law firm. The other nine of the ten largest offshore law firms are registered in British overseas jurisdictions. When countries complain to Britain about the activities run out of its offshore havens, Britain claims that these places are independent and that there is nothing it can do. I've heard time and time again from officials in Berlin and in Paris and in Washington and in other countries that they've been told by the British government that, yes, they're well aware of what's going on in Jersey and they think it's very unfortunate, but they don't have the powers to intervene. Well, that's a straightforward lie. They do have the powers to intervene. They just choose not to. Britain plays this kind of game of um, pretending when it suits them to pretend that these places are independent. At the end of the day, Britain um, appoints the governor, appoints lots of um, senior people in these places. They're responsible for foreign relations and defense, and also they can veto their legislation as well. So Britain has a massive degree of control. Basically, it is controlling these places, allowing them a little bit of political space. During his time as economic advisor to Jersey, John Christensen frequently travelled to London for talks with various British government departments. As economic advisor, um, I had a lot of contact with different departments. Um, traditionally, UK governments have tried not to interfere in the domestic affairs of places like Jersey. So it happens in a more subtle sort of way. You kind of go and talk to someone, either at the Home Office or the Treasury, and they'd say, we're not actually particularly keen on this piece of legislation. It might be a good idea if you didn't go down that route. And over a cup of tea, that's quite a strong signal. That's a signal, go back to the island and say, they don't want you to do this. The British government prefers not to interfere overtly. Instead, it communicates its desires through informal discussions. There is no paper trail or official statement 
Discussions take place behind closed doors. The relationship that these places have with London is, is very much um, about the British establishment and people understanding each other. I mean, anybody who knows, who is British or knows a Briti British people, knows that communication between us is often very subtle and you have to kind of know the codes when people say stuff, I mean, a lot of irony involved and um, a lot of um, kind of codified language for the British establishment that um, people kind of understand how it works. And I think that is very much the case with the British relationship with the tax havens. I think there's a lot of understanding of what we can and can't do without anyone having to actually spell it out. By keeping its power hidden, Britain is able to claim that these jurisdictions are politically autonomous. Independence for Cayman is not on government's agenda. That's the message being said to the UN Special Committee on Decolonization. Attorney Steve McField will be representing government at the UN meeting. The committee was set up to help colonies around the world on the road to independence. But Mr. McField says he'll be making it clear that Cayman is not ready for that transition. And that message is that the Premier his cabinet, his party, has no mandate from the people of the Cayman Islands to seek independence. That is the message that I will be carrying. When the Bahamas declared independence from Britain in 1967, the offshore bankers relocated to the Cayman Islands and continued their business from there. It was the British connection that reassured bankers and their clients that their money was safe. This British bedrock, that is what has allowed these places to become so trusted by the financial services industry and, and offshore finance and all these people. In reality, much of the wealth administered in Britain's offshore havens is controlled from London. The City of London, by and large, likes to do its really dirty work outside London. There might, heaven forbid, be a, a regulator who actually takes the job seriously and starts to prosecute them for fraud in London. So better to do the frauds offshore in Gibraltar or Jersey, where there's much less risk that a serious prosecution will ever happen. Deals are often discussed and concluded in London, but then registered offshore for tax, transparency and regulatory purposes. What they allow the city to do is to get involved in dirty business. But then when the scandal hits, to say, well, they're kind of independent, there's nothing we can do about those places, that's, that's not us, that's, that's tax haven activity and we're, we're the city, you know, we're, we're not involved in that kind of stuff. So it's an incredibly kind of convenient relationship. The City of London has shaped the, the way in which Jersey, Guernsey and the British Overseas Territories have developed as tax havens. I, I see these places as the Frankensteins created by, by the city of London. Today, the UK is the world's largest provider of international financial services. The UK has an almost unique role in global finance. Um, if you look at uh, data, the kind of data that we've constructed in the Financial Secrecy Index, you can see the relative shares of each country in the global provision of financial services exports, that's financial services to non-residents. Now, there are two big centres and everything else is quite small in comparison. The two large centres are the United States, with around 19% of the global market, and the United Kingdom and its offshore jurisdictions, which have around 25% of the global market. And if you add to that uh, other jurisdictions, ex-colonies, but recently independent, fairly recently, by which I mean Hong Kong, Singapore, maybe even Dubai and Bahrain, and Cyprus, then you reach a figure of nearly 40%. And I think that figure represents better the position of London in the global financial market. The soldiers left, the, the administrators left all the colonies, but they still kept a significant degree of control over the financial flows from these former, um, the, 
former parts of empire in the rest of the world. So you could describe it as a second empire, um, Britain's second empire, sort of hidden financial empire spanning large parts of the globe. At the time of the British Empire, the City of London was the world's largest global financial centre. Not only Britain's colonies, but also independent countries did their banking in London and used the empire's currency for trade and financing. As the empire declined, so too did the City of London. The establishment of the London Euromarket enabled City of London banks to continue to exploit their empire-era networks and expertise, and the creation of secrecy jurisdictions gave banks access to large amounts of cheap money. International banks from across the globe set up branches in London and Britain's offshore jurisdictions in order to take advantage of this new system. This system has taken the place of the occupation, uh, I mean, up till 62, uh, for France, I don't know for England, but about the same time, England were physically present in India, for instance, or in, in uh, other colonies. And when you look at the fl money flows through the tax havens, they are increasing when we withdraw from the colonies. We are still plundering developing countries as former colonial powers. Wealthy individuals, organized crime and corporations shifted their wealth offshore in exchange for secrecy and no tax. And as countries around the world began to deregulate and open their economies, it became ever easier to do so. Today, as much as half of all global offshore wealth may be hidden in Britain's secrecy jurisdictions. One of the losers is Africa whose flight capital flows mostly into the modern British spider's web. I think it's no coincidence that Britain's offshore empire emerged more or less at the same time as the collapse of the formal empire. We tend to think of Africa as being a huge net debtor to the rest of the world. But that was the extent of their debts at the end of 2008, 177 billion. The debt of sub-Saharan African nations stood at $177 billion in 2008. Yet the wealth these countries' elites had moved offshore between 1970 and 2008 is estimated at $944 billion, over five times their foreign debt. $944 billion dollars. Do the maths. Far from being a net debtor, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, is a net creditor to the rest of the world. As capital moved offshore, African nations borrowed money from international banks at high interest. Over time, these debts became so great that they may never be repaid. Secrecy jurisdictions were starving developing nations of their wealth and their tax revenues. For a long time, a lot of developing countries, including recently Ecuador, have been trying to set up a UN tax body, which is of a higher value than what is currently there, which is the UN Tax Committee. And every time this has happened, it has gotten blocked. During the financing for development process in Addis Ababa last year, uh, I think it was the UK and the US that blocked attempts again to set up this uh, world tax organization. So why would they not want to have democratic decision making in global decisions on how tax gets collected across borders? I don't understand this. As long as we have cross-border activity that involves both criminal and legal activity, as long as we're unable to separate the two, this is going to continue to be a problem. Western nations block attempts to provide greater transparency of international financial flows and the implementation of global standards for the collection of tax across borders, whilst elites in developing nations use offshore centres to hide their wealth offshore. The oil from Gabon has not benefited people in Gabon. And this is true for the copper in Zambia, for the... For the gold in Mozambique or in Mali, 
they have benefited the company that do extract it and their shareholders. It has benefited the corrupt elite in the country. In developing countries, the offshore system of tax havens has facilitated the looting of these countries by their elites. Um, it has enabled them to steal the money and keep it safe somewhere else. Illicit financial flows, because the anonymity that drives them creates incentives for people in positions of power to be corrupt. This is why there's a group of countries where development progress is so difficult. It's that the incentives of individuals and the ability to pursue them through all the mechanisms that underpin illicit flows outweigh the type of mechanisms that, in, that lead you to a powerful, representative, effective state that can start to deliver development. Worldwide, developing countries lose over a trillion dollars every year in capital flight and tax evasion. Most of this wealth flows into large Western nations, like the United States and Britain, and enables their currencies to stay strong, whilst developing nations' currencies remain weak. But illicit flows into Western nations also had another unexpected side effect. The economies of the United States and Britain began to financialize. The origins of this financialization, or de-industrialization, go back to the 1960s. Anti-war demonstrators protest US involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. President Johnson, meanwhile, let it be known that the FBI is closely watching all anti-war activity. In the 1960s, US economist Michael Hudson was working at Chase Manhattan Bank on Wall Street as Chase's balance of payments economist. During the 1960s, the United States uh, balance of payments deficit was entirely a result of foreign military expenditures. Dollars were flowing out of the United States as a result of the cost of the Vietnam War. The United States attempted to prevent the dollars flowing to Vietnam from being deposited in foreign banks. The government asked Chase to set up a branch in Saigon during the Vietnam War. And as you can imagine, it didn't have uh, windows. It was sort of a fortress. It lost money. But uh, the government uh, went to Chase because it said, if you don't get this uh, money that's being thrown off by uh, the military in uh, Vietnam, then it's going to go into French banks. It'll get to General de Gaulle, and you know what he's going to do every month. He's going to cash it in for gold. That's what the United States was trying to stop. The US was not successful in stopping the outflow of money, so it began to hatch a different plan. In 1967, Michael Hudson was handed a memo by a former State Department employee. In 1967, uh, I was given by a former State Department employee uh, in the elevator at Chase Manhattan a memo from the State Department urging that Chase Manhattan would uh, take the lead in helping the United States become the Switzerland of the world, meaning the flight capital. The State Department, uh, through Chase, asked me to estimate how much money do you think is available if America were to become the new Switzerland, and how do we do it? Uh, the plan was to organize offshore banking centers uh, in the Caribbean and elsewhere, and the hot money wouldn't come directly into Chase because that wouldn't be uh, nice and uh, very legal. What happened was that uh, the Latin American criminals, other criminals, drug dealers, uh, all sorts of organized crime would put their money in the offshore Caribbean banks and these offshore banks would then uh, deposit the inflow in the head office. By moving offshore dollars back into the United States, the US was able to stop the outflow of dollars and support the value of its currency. 
every country looks to its foreign exchange rate. And uh, the foreign exchange rate is not only imports and exports, it's capital movements. Uh, and if you look at the International Monetary Fund's uh, monthly international financial statistics, uh, you have sort of a steady balance of trade, a steady immigrants' remittances. What goes up and down are called errors and omissions. Uh, what the United Nations and uh, the IMF call errors and omissions are flight capital. It's the, uh, the reason that it's omitted is uh, they don't like to really look at this. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, Roy Ovid Hall, economist for the U.S. Commerce Department, wanted to include uh, criminal uh, movements in the balance of payment statistics. And uh, Congress got very upset. Uh, I, I, I was told in Washington, the, con the uh, argument was, we're a Christian country. We don't want to report crime. It's just, don't look at it. Uh, and uh, they, they forbid him to uh, include uh, criminal money in the balance of payments. I guess now you call it errors and omissions. You don't call it uh, criminal inflow and outflow. In the 1960s and 70s, Britain was faced with a similar dilemma as the United States. Money was flowing out, and this decreased the value of the pound. Britain realized that it, too, could support the value of its currency by opening its domestic markets to the trillions of dollars passing through its offshore havens. But just as in the United States, this had an unexpected side effect. The British banks uh, today, uh, just as in the 19th century, don't put their money into uh, British manufacturing. They put their money into real estate speculation, into financial speculation, foreign currency trade. Uh, so uh, the financialization of London has uh, helped deindustrialize the country because it's enabled uh, sterling to be supported by this huge inflow of hot money, this inflow of uh, drug dealing money and criminal money and uh, tax of Asian money all over the world uh, that is going to London instead of going to Switzerland, Liechtenstein, or the Caribbean. With the silent backing of the United States, Britain's offshore havens grew rapidly. And before long, the offshore system developed into the world's dominant international financial market. Few were aware how this market functioned. In 1986, economist John Christensen went offshore to investigate. He applied for a position at the Jersey office of one of the world's major accounting firms. Well, Deloitte and Touche was, um, I was working in what's called company and trust administration, straightforward offshore stuff. I went offshore specifically to work in that area because that's where you're dealing with the offshore companies, the shell companies, the offshore trusts, and you're administering them. That way I could, I could see from working inside uh, a big global accounting firm exactly what the clients were doing. I had complete access to all the client files. And over the course of my period of working with Deloitte Touche, I investigated over a hundred of their clients offshore, and this is what I found. There were some insider traders, some market rigging, some avoiding disclosure of conflicts of interest, illicit arms trading, illicit political campaign donations, contract kickbacks, bribery, fraudulent invoicing, trade mispricing, and at the bottom, tax evasion. Okay? This is what the clients were doing. On the basis of a sample of the clients that I looked at, not a single client was involved in what I would regard as genuinely legitimate activity. They were all involved in some kind of tax dodging or uh, worse. I met with uh, Carl Levin, he used to be an American senator, and he made a lot of inquiries into private banking, asking questions to the bankers. What do you think? The percentage is among your clients that are using these companies for legitimate purposes. And the answer was, I believe that 99.9% .9 of my clients are using these companies for illicit purposes. This is a reality. This is American bankers telling what they are doing. And it's exactly the same thing with uh, UK bankers helping their clients to have accounts in Panama or in Bermuda or in Cayman Islands. 
Secrecy jurisdictions are heavily used for fraudulent and grey area financial activities. Areas where secrecy is not just desirable, but a necessity. Legitimate financial activity has no need for the secrecy offshore havens provide, nor a desire to pay the high fees offshore banks and law firms charge. Today, close to half of the world's secrecy jurisdictions are British dependencies. In public, these jurisdictions claim they are transparent and their financial services sectors are engaged in legitimate financial activities. Our economy is not based on secrecy. It's, uh, it's based on transparency. It's based on a sound regulatory environment. Uh, it's based on good governance and good government. Uh, with a, a British government uh, legal system. That's what our uh, financial institutions are based on. Well, tonight we have a response from the head of Cayman Finance after a group of U.S.-based anti-tax evasion activists announced plans to travel to Cayman to draw attention to what they feel is corporate tax evasion. Finance chairman Mr. Richard Cole says he's encouraging the group to visit and says our financial sector has nothing to hide. I would say if anybody wants to come to Cayman to find out what co what's coming, you know, what, what we do here, come on down. We have no secrets here. When I went to the Cayman Islands um, back in 2008, I think it was, I called the government spokesman and he said, OK, we have had an order from on high that nobody is allowed to speak to you. You are off limits. In 2011, journalist Nicholas Shackson released Treasure Islands, a groundbreaking book about the offshore system. The author of a series of international media reports says he would welcome a debate with Cayman Finance Chair Tony Travers. Mr. Travers recently called Nicholas Shackson an imbecile with the understanding of, a nev of an 11-year-old. There are always going to be the politics of envy. Now, the pol politics of envy are exacerbated by uh, imbeciles who don't actually understand what's going on in the Cayman Islands. I don't know what, he, what he's talking about. And, and furthermore, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The Cayman Islands is the fifth largest financial center in the world. It hosts 80,000 registered companies, over three quarters of the world's hedge funds, and $1.9 trillion in deposits. It has a population of 60,000 roughly equivalent to New York's homeless population. A strange mixture of characters populate the offshore world. British ex-public schoolboys, members of the world's intelligence services, global criminals, assorted lords and ladies, and bankers galore. With so much at stake for so many wealthy and powerful individuals, it may come as no surprise that Britain's offshore havens have developed their own curious mechanisms to prevent information from leaking out. For many people who work offshore and who don't like what they're doing, it's very hard indeed to dissent because they will be attacked personally with a degree of viciousness, which is quite extraordinary. Most of the time, the, the, the instruments of suppression are relatively sophisticated. You won't get promotion by doing this, or you know, your family won't like it. It's not generally, let's slam them in prison. That's far too crude. We are talking about very substantially, you know, the establishment, the British establishment in, in these cases. The, the mechanisms are very, very subtle. Sort of ostracism is, is, is one way of doing it. Um, these peculiar mechanisms for, you know, if someone tries to, to blow the whistle, you find all sorts of methods that aren't the most, you know, just fire them, you give them far too much work to do, you steer them in a different direction. One person who is intimately familiar with how suppression works offshore is former Jersey Senator and Health Minister, Stuart Sivray. In 2009, he leaked a report on a rogue nurse suspected of killing patients at Jersey's hospital. It all came to a head during a state's debate on Tuesday the 10th of March. Senator Stuart Sivray brought the sitting to a standstill, claiming Senator Jimmy Pershard had sworn at him and told him to go and top himself. Senator Pershard denied the claim, saying, I absolutely refute that. 
But less than a week later, he was forced to admit he had lied. Senator Pershard has now admitted that on another occasion, he did tell Senator Stuart Sivray to go and do everyone a favour and slit his wrists. I was uh, arrested at my house one morning uh, by uh, six plainclothes police officers. There were another two specialist data search police officers on hand and also another two police officers in full body armor of one of those battering rams they kind of use in drugs raids. So 10 uh, police officers descended on me without a, uh, without a search warrant. The property was turned over from top to bottom. All of the computers were seized and searched. All kinds of private constituency data was stolen by the police. Shortly after we began filming, a police officer exited the police station. As he hurried past, he grinned at the camera. The officer was on his way to test the sirens on his motorbike, which he did at intervals throughout much of the remainder of the interview. When it came to prosecuting me... Stuart Sivray was prosecuted under the Data Protection Law. Now, when the authorities were prosecuting me, I claimed that this was a legitimate public interest disclosure defence. And I, with an expert witness, was able to produce a set of reports that effectively destroyed the prosecution case. In reaction to this, the magistrates ruled that Stuart Sivray's defence case, that he had leaked the report in the public interest, would no longer be admissible, but continued to prosecute him all the same, without a defence case. Over the past seven years, Stuart Sivray has been repeatedly taken to court and imprisoned three times. He does not know when or if the persecution will end, nor does he know when he will find himself behind bars again. To look at Jersey from the outside, it looks like it's got a prosecution system, it looks like it's got a court and a legislature, but none of it's real. It's a Potemkin village. None of these systems in Jersey meet the tests of being objective, of being objective or actually functioning properly. The experience that Stuart Sivray had is, you know, he's perhaps at the, at the blunter end of the, of the, of the uh, scale. You know, he was simply suppressed and taken to court on trumped up charges. Carry on being, let's carry on to pretend to do the interview. They might get bored. This is the kind of, this is the kind of how oppression happens in Jersey, you see. All kinds of little things get done to harass people, you know. Even, they don't often go to the kinds of extremes that they did against me in terms of actually arresting me and putting me in prison. But uh, the authorities use all kinds of other lesser little methods to interfere with people, kind of sabotage things, you know, uh, obstruct people, make life difficult for people. You know, if you annoy the establishment in Jersey, you won't get a job here. You know, you, you know your children won't get decent jobs. You know, that's kind of how, how it works, you know. I went to Jersey in uh, March 2009 with, with Nick Shackson. About 24 hours after we arrived in Jersey, we were there for several days, Nick said, did you know that, have you noticed that we're being followed? Ever since we arrived in, at the airport, we've been followed. He said, don't look now, but we're being followed now. Turns out he was quite correct. We were being followed. And I found that very disturbing, very disturbing indeed. They have a saying in Jersey, if you don't like it here, there's always a boat in the morning. Jersey finance promotional literature states, Jersey represents an extension of the city of London. It's where the city of London chooses to do many of the activities which they couldn't do in London itself. We're here just to talk about this one company called Appleby. I'll just read what they say on their website. Members of the firm, Appleby, have gone on not only to political office, but also um, in a number of centres, Bermuda, Jersey, the Isle of Man and the Cayman Islands, to senior judicial office. So essentially, they're boasting of the fact that their staff and their partners have a real interchange between the people that are in power in these offshore financial centres. The same lawyers and accountants who set up and administer offshore trusts also occupy senior political positions. 
In Britain's offshore world, most politicians are in business. They lobby for business and promote business interests. They draft, refine and pass legislation. Politicians sit on the boards of the companies they are supposed to regulate. There is no place for dirty money in Britain. Indeed, there should be no place for dirty money anywhere. The challenge I'm laying down for every country today is to root out the rot of corruption, to ensure transparency over what your own companies are doing, require transparency for foreign companies in your country too, and work with us to spread this approach to transparency around the world. In public, British politicians claim they are cracking down on secrecy jurisdictions and corruption. But in practice, they do the opposite. I mean, when I talk to politicians in Brussels, they say that they've had more lobbyists from London, and including politicians, come to them to protect the City of London's interests than they've had from every other European member state combined, which gives you some idea of the extent to which British politicians see themselves as essentially lobbyists for the City of London. We begin with our big story. Cayman's efforts to ensure transparency in its financial services sector is being recognised by the international community. Earlier this week, the UK's Prime Minister, David Cameron, told Parliament that the tax haven label placed on its Crown dependencies and overseas territories is unfair. Many British politicians have personal and business ties with the City of London and British secrecy jurisdictions. Former British Prime Minister David Cameron's father, Ian Cameron, was an expert in offshore funds and was involved in offshore trusts from the 1980s onwards. At this courthouse behind me here in St Helier, we found this. It's a document called a grant of probate and it's attached to the English will of none other than Ian Cameron, David Cameron's father. Say hello to mum and dad. Hi, <laughs> Bar, how are you? Good to see you. Ian Cameron was certainly a wealthy man. In 2009, his personal fortune was estimated by researchers for the Sunday Times Rich List at £10 million. Yet, when Ian Cameron died in 2010, his estate was much smaller than might be expected, just £2.7 million. In many cases, it's the politicians and their cronies and their families and so on, and the business people who sponsor the, the political parties, who are using these offshore services themselves. So, so they've got no personal interest in closing it down. If they wanted to close it down, they could do it tomorrow. The fact of the matter is they don't want to do it because they themselves are complicit with the process. If you come from the same kind of background, you know the right people, then all the kind of legal niceties of, um, will, will often fall away. You can get away with doing all sorts of things that they wouldn't just let any old person, you know, if you came knocking on the door saying, can you set up an offshore company to do this, they'd tell you to get lost. But if you're part of the networks, you can, you can do these kinds of things. Um, so that's a very important part of, the, um, part of the whole system. Upper class British public school kind of um, establishment that has been there since, you know, for centuries. The British establishment, an old boys' network of privileged elites, had carved out a lucrative niche for themselves in the offshore world after the demise of empire. They transformed themselves from administrators of empire into financial handlers for the global elite and multinational corporations. As more money flowed offshore, societies around the globe began to feel the impact of the offshore world. The reality is not what you believe, that uh, um, your prime minister has uh, the power to, to decide on the future of your country. The power is hidden here. We have country after country around the world where the lack of financial transparency about taxation, about ownership, about corruption, has undermined the extent to which governments deliver representative policy making for their citizens. You know, we have extreme cases like the, the hiding of um, tax evasion by 
people in finance ministries in Greece, in France. Um, but we also have this system that in general is geared towards anonymous company ownership, the anonymous ownership of properties across London, of half of the land in Scotland. You know, do we really think there's any circumstances in which governments work better, in which markets work better, in which the distribution of income and assets is better, when we allow so much to be hidden? Who wants to not know who you're doing business with? Who wants their government to have people working for it or to be led by people whose assets are hidden, whose financial transactions um, are, are conducted anonymously offshore? You know, this is a bad direction for the world. We need the citizens to understand what is happening, that they are the ones who is carrying the burden and that uh, some individuals having the power are exonerating themselves. Ordinary people are paying taxes, rich people are not. So this is inequality and it is leading up to populism because it shows so clearly that the people today leading the world are not able to take care of the interest of ordinary people. Back in the 60s and 70s, you know, tax evasion or, or pushing back against taxation, it was kind of seen as anti-establishment. So, you know, the Rolling Stones and um, Phil Collins, all these people kind of going offshore, going away. Um, it was seen as a sort of rebellious thing to do. And if you fast forward to the present day, um, now that is the establishment. The offshore system is the establishment. Today, Offshore is the way elites and multinational corporations conduct their affairs. Tax evasion is the way business is done. This kind of sophisticated cheating requires a huge infrastructure. We like to talk about the pinstripe infrastructure of highly educated people who think it is their right to help others to cheat societies. We have a new mafia in town. It does not actually shoot people, does not put bullets in their kneecaps, but its trade is just as deadly. It deprives people of opportunities to have health care, education, security, justice, and essentially a fulfilling life. Accountants form the backbone of the offshore system. They administer the structures that allow individuals and corporations to shift their money offshore and evade taxes. There are about 2.5 million professionally qualified accountants on this planet. About 330,000 are in the UK. Well-known people, well-dressed, well-fed, highly paid, are sitting in city centre offices and they are paid to dream up tax avoidance schemes for individuals and for corporations. We can all elect a government which says, vote for us, we will give you better health care, better education, better security. And next day, accountants say, sorry about that, folks, you elected this government, but we actually got a tax avoidance scheme, and the Amazons and the Googles and Microsofts won't be paying any taxes in your jurisdiction. Too bad you voted for it, but actually, you're going to get something else. So it's a crazy world that part of the business model at big accountancy firms is how to deny public the services by erosion of tax revenues. And these firms are then rewarded with government-funded contracts, and the same firms are then advising uh, go uh, local governments and the central governments, and the same firms then report on the company accounts and tell us all is well. When I argue this with a Price Waterhouse partner in a face-to-face -face debate, he said, Professor Sicker, you never give us credit for anything. We generate millions of dollars of revenues, and we have lots and lots of satisfied clients. What is your problem? And my response was very simple, that's the language of drug pushers and pimps. In Britain, a new breed of civil servant was rising to the top. One such civil servant was Dave Hartnett, who rose to the top of HMRC, the UK Tax Authority. 
Dave Hartnett had a new way of collecting tax. Deals would be negotiated on an individual basis, behind closed doors. In the case of the largest clients, Dave Hartnett frequently led the negotiations himself. British Telecom was one of the first companies through the programme and received a refund of over £1 billion. BT's chief executive, Ben Favayan, wrote, Earnings per share up 14%, and nice to know that we have a £1 billion credit from the taxman. Dave Hartnett claimed this approach was more efficient. Litigation in the courts is really phenomenally expensive in this day and age all over the world. Um, and I think is to be avoided where possible. Um, and the art is to persuade people to pay by strength of argument and the like. After protests erupted in 2011, the Treasury Select Committee questioned Dave Hartnett. Dave Hartnett claimed he could not give any information due to taxpayer confidentiality. What in statute prevents you from disclosing information to Parliament? All my advice, Mr Barclay, so far has been that um, I am prevented, and my colleagues are prevented, um, by the Act and by the decision of the Commissioners. Dave Hartnett failed to mention that the legal advice he had received stated that the disclosure of information was at the discretion of the head of HMRC. The head of HMRC was Dave Hartnett himself. Just like the Mafia has penetrated the state, accountancy firms have also penetrated the state. The head of anti-avoidance in the UK uh, tax authority uh, is from one of these firms. The newly appointed chairman of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which is a tax authority, is a partner from KPMG. Their partners have penetrated the state. They are running the treasury. Britain's financial services industry had penetrated the state and began to shape its laws for its own benefit. The degree of capture, political capture by the City of London, by the big banks and the big law firms, is so enormous that the politicians have effectively become their spokespersons. With the government unwilling to act in the interest of the public, a group of protesters confronted Dave Hartnett at a private event in Oxford. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just going to take a few moments of your time. Here tonight, to present today is given an award. It is the Lifetime Achievement Award for services to corporate tax planning. friend to the industry, a great friend to many of us over the years and you know really we just can't thank you enough for what he's done. Obviously it was at Vodafone, um, you know it saved us billions uh, off our tax bill and our friends at Goldman Sachs as well, we've also saved us millions 20, as well. 25 so, million or so. These people are trespassers and intruders. I mean no, we've had problems they with have, This is an unlawful conspiracy to trespass. And so you will go, really sir. Like you will depart immediately before we set the dogs on you. Go. You are trespassing, so, so okay. trespassing scum. Go. After his retirement, Dave Hartnett moved to the private sector. One of his positions was at accountancy firm Deloitte, where he advises foreign governments on corporate taxation. Dave Hartnett is a companion of the Order of the Bath, an honour bestowed on him by the British monarch. We have former 
our ministers acting as advisors to accountancy firms. Accountancy firms provide jobs and consultancies for potential ministers. To my mind, really, it's an indication of corrupt structures. People are buying and selling influences. When a former minister works for an accountancy firm, he's not providing any accounting knowledge. He's opening political opportunities, home and abroad. That is what they are doing. I hope by now, you'll share my view that I don't trust most bankers, I don't trust most lawyers, I don't trust most accounting firms. I actually think they're engaged in a conspiracy against public interest. In Britain, secrecy and complexity in finance and government help to obscure corruption in public office. Financial structures are often so complex that even after they are publicly revealed, they are not widely recognised for what they are. An example of this is PFI, the Private Finance Initiative. PFI is Private Finance Initiative. It is a way of funding public infrastructure, things like hospitals, schools, roads and bridges, but financing them via the private sector rather than the historical method, which is via central government. Over a period of 30 or 40 years, the amount of kind of repayment costs will be sort of three or four times higher overall than if you borrowed it from central government in the first place. So it's basically a giant accounting scam. Once the PFI policy has been set up, um, you find that the big four accountancy firms were actually um, paid members of staff within the Treasury Department, who were then actually going around and selling and advising upon the implement implementation of PFI contracts by public authorities effectively saying, come to us and we will show you how to derive the most benefit from it. In other words, how to perhaps exploit the legislation. Even the offices of the state tax authority are now owned offshore. HMRC, which is the, the tax collector here in the UK, their offices are owned in Bermuda by a company called Mapley Steps. It's quite incredible. The company that owns the PFI contract to run HMRC's head office borrowed money from offshore investors at 15% interest. Because the interest was so high, the company was losing money. Therefore, it did not pay tax. In 2011, HMRC could not prove that any PFI company was paying any tax in the UK. I think we need to have a serious conversation about the, the role of government in this whole debacle and how much our government has been penetrated by big banks and accountancy firms and ultimately in whose interest it operates. The reason we were protesting outside the Africa PPP conference is that we wanted to make sure that citizens back in Africa should hear about the fact that such policies have been a complete failure here in the UK. We know that these products are not being marketed to African countries in their own best interests. Their only motivation is to spread the reach of financial services into new markets. It's all being promoted in the interests of the City of London. What you're seeing is a, basically a second form of colonialization. You've had initially occupation, resource extraction, um, you know, and through that process, you know, countries like Britain, which have had a, a large offshore empire, have developed significant networks, and now those networks being used to promote and exploit financial services. The City of London was the beating financial heart of the British Empire. As Britain's empire declined, the city transformed itself from a hub operating the financial machinery of empire into a global financial centre. Former insignificant outposts of empire became the basis for a spider's web of offshore secrecy jurisdictions that captured wealth from across the globe and funnelled it to the City of London. Today, 25% of international finance is conducted on British territory. 
almost half of the world's secrecy jurisdictions are under British protection. Up to half of all offshore wealth may be hidden in Britain's offshore havens. Financial services is how Britain's elites make their money. And it is also where former government ministers, senior civil servants and retired spooks from MI5 and MI6 receive lucrative consulting positions after their time in public service. Together they have transformed Britain and its dependencies into the world's largest tax haven, harming development throughout the world and turning Britain itself into a country that serves, above all, the interests of its elites. Thank you.